Amen, amen. Hey, if you brought a Bible, and I hope you did bring a physical copy of the Bible today, I would invite you to take it and turn with me uh, to the book of Acts. We're returning to the book of Acts in chapter 9, and we're going to be, Lord willing, finishing up chapter 9 today. <clears throat> On this, our 30th, I think, if I can count correctly, 30th sermon in this book. And we're going to try to finish chapter 9 today. So, looking forward to years to come in this wonderful book. Anyway, so we're in Acts chapter 9. We're going to be reading, a, starting in verse 36 today and down through the end of the chapter in verse uh, 43. So I'm reading out of the English Standard Version of the Bible. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word. The Bible says, Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Leda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are high and lifted up. You are holy, you are righteous. You are mighty to save, and you are powerful to bring life in the midst of death. And God, we give you glory and we give you praise. And we confess, Lord, that apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ that was poured out on Mount Calvary as an offering for us, we have no standing before you. We have no right to come into your presence. Lord, I have no right to stand before these people and to preach your word, and I certainly have no right to be in your presence and handle the book. But Lord, because you equip us and because you qualify us, we're gathered here today, and we give you thanks and we give you praise. And over the next few moments, God, we want to just intentionally commit this time into your hands, knowing that you've got to work to do in this body of believers. You have a word for each of us, and I pray, God, that we would be surrendered and yielded to the book, and that you would work in each and every life in this place. God, that we would look more like your son, Jesus, when we walk out of here than we did when we came in this morning. And we'll give you praise, and we'll give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, next week, uh, I, I won't be with you next Sunday morning. I'm going to be preaching revival uh, services in Hobart First Baptist Church. And so you're going to have a dear friend of mine, David McDowell. He's going to be here in the pulpit uh, in my stead next week. Uh, he's a retired pastor from up in Missouri, pastored a lot of churches up there. And he's been a mentor and a friend to me over the years. And so <clears throat> he's going to be here in my stead. But did you know next Sunday, the 23rd of April is the anniversary of our, our meeting, 
so to speak. It was when, when, we, when my family and I, when we came in view of a call last year, was on April 23rd. Matter of fact, my first encounter with the whole congregation, you sang happy birthday to me. It was my birthday. You remember that? Okay. Um, we felt right at home in that moment. Well, you know, that was, that was about, you know, just over 10 months ago. And I'll tell you what, the last 10 months have just flown by sometimes. And and other times, it's kind of been like the youth kid I had one time. I had a youth student when I was a youth pastor. He posted a picture of him and his girlfriend on Facebook. They'd been dating for about a month. And he said, honey, it's been a month, but it's felt like an eternity. <laughs> anyway, they didn't stay together very long. So, <laughs> it's brought a unique set of challenges. And, and so we've, you know... up. <laughs> We've been short-staffed at times, and we've, you know, we've struggled through some things. But I'm going to tell you something. Um, the last 10 months have just been an absolute joy. And, uh, and, and our staff, you know, one thing that we, we've figured out early on <clears throat> in this journey together uh, is, has been that, uh, you know, you could, you could ask somebody on our ministry team, well, what do you do all day? And they'd say, I have no idea. Right? It was, it was just like, I can't even describe to you everything that's flying in and out of that office all the time. And so we had to get some structure to that. And uh, a few months ago, one of the things that we did in our staff meetings is that we implemented something that we, we call the first four. And so in every staff meeting, you could come to one of our staff meetings and you would see this. We sit down and we do a little bit of calendar stuff. We have a devotion time. And then we spend the bulk of our time deciding what is the first Four. What are the first four things that are the most essential that we accomplish uh, in the week ahead? <clears throat> right? So we list those out on a whiteboard, and uh, typically at any given moment, you could ask our staff, and they'll know um, a, a, what, what part of the first four they're working on right now. What's the most essential thing that they're doing? Because there's so much going on, but there are some things that are immediate that have to be addressed right now. Right? And so we decide what are the first four things. What are the primary things amidst all the, the hustle and the bustle and the busyness of, of life and ministry uh, here at First Baptist Church? What are the, the, the first four things that are our primary focus? Well, you know, I think that sometimes as disciples of Christ, we need to be reminded ourselves of what is the primary focus of our lives as disciples of Jesus. Because I think you can attest to this, we're coming into a, one of the busiest seasons of the calendar, right? <clears throat> we're coming into May, which brings with it, you know, you got Mother's Day in there, you got graduations, you have, you know, you got ceremonies, and then you get into summer, and you got camps, and you got all, the, and all these things, and you got ball games, and you got... It, the list goes on, and it is busy, and at times it is chaotic, and let's just call it sometimes it's downright frustrating. I, somebody amen that, glory. <laughs> life gets busy, but here's the reality is that even when life is busy, a disciple of Jesus Christ is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so there are no vacations from, from being a disciple. Right? You can't do like, I had a pastor friend one time. They'd been in, in the throes of full-time ministry for, for several years, and they were getting their first real full-time vacation. And, uh, and, and so they were packing up to leave, and his wife looked at him. He, my, my pastor friend, he was putting his Bible in his bag, and she said, what are you doing with that? He said, well, I'm taking my Bible. She said, no, you're not. <laughs> right? We can't be like that. Okay? that. That can't be the approach. Where, where we take a vacation from being disciples for a season. So in all the busyness of life, let me ask you, what is the primary focus of a disciple? Today's narrative in the life and in the ministry of the Apostle Peter is going to give us a great picture of what it looks like and what it means to be a disciple at all times, no matter what's going on and how busy it might become. And so we open this narrative in Joppa, <clears throat> which is a, a town on the, the western side or the, uh, between, you know, the, essentially the water and Jerusalem. Uh, it's on the western side of Jerusalem. Uh, this small town there, 
And there's a disciple that we're told about in verse 36 named Tabitha. Tabitha and her, uh, Tabitha is her Aramaic name. Dorcas is her Greek name. And both of those names mean gazelle. Okay, so here's this woman named Tabitha. We're told a couple of things about Tabitha. First of all, if you were to look at where she is in Joppa, you would know that a uh, good chance Tabitha is the fruit of of Philip's ministry from Acts chapter 8. After Philip ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch, you'll remember that God caught him up and delivered him to a city called Azotus. And from Azotus, the Bible says that he traveled north through all the villages and preaching the gospel to Caesarea. Well, Joppa just happens to land right between Azotus and Caesarea. So there is a very good chance that Tabitha is a disciple only because of the fruit of the ministry of Philip who traveled through there preaching the gospel. And look at what it says about Tabitha. It says that she was a disciple, which means she is a student of the word. She is continuing in and abiding in Christ and committed her life to his word and to truth. It says that she was full of good works and acts of charity. She was full of good works and acts of charity. So what's that tell us? Tabitha had a wonderful social ministry in Joppa. Okay? And what I mean by that is, is she would take care of uh, the poor, maybe providing financially for impoverished people in the community. Maybe she would go and she would seek out the sick who everyone else was shunning and rejecting societally. And, and maybe she would go to the sick people and maybe she would minister to them and take care of their needs. Maybe she had groups of widows who, uh, because of their life situation... In, first century, in the first century world, they didn't have the ability to provide for themselves. If they didn't have a husband, they didn't have, um, they didn't have money. They didn't have necessary means to get new clothing. And maybe she would go and she would, she would sew tunics and clothing and garments for these widows to help provide for the widows in her community. The long and the short of it is this, that Tabitha was making a great gospel impact on the world around her by showing the works of Christ to the people in need. She had a great social ministry. And so she was going about and she's doing the good work. She's following Christ day in and day out. She's doing these acts of charity. She's helping people. She's serving people. Maybe even it's to the point that Tabitha had people where they're almost uh, depending on her at times, where, where they, they, they're just so uh, thankful for her commitment to help and to serve that, that there are people who look forward to her visits because they know that it may be the only way they get food. It may be the only way that they have clothing. It may be the only way that they have any means to get through their day. And one day, Tabitha was out and she's ministering to the people. She's serving in the community when all of a sudden, she begins to feel weak. So Tabitha, feeling weak, she cuts her ministry day short. She goes back home. She rests for a while, hoping that that's going to make things better. And as the day progresses, her illness progresses. Her friends come over that evening to check on her, knowing that she hadn't been feeling well earlier in the day. And, and, and they walk in, and they can immediately tell something is wrong with Tabitha. Her body is weak. Her skin is, is pale. She looks frail. She looks sick. And, and so they start trying everything that they know. They're, they're <clears throat> using all of the, the medicine that they knew how. They're doing every treatment option that they can come up with. But... Within just a few days, very quickly, Tabitha goes from being a, a vibrant servant in the community, ministering to the people, to lying on her deathbed. And eventually, the Bible tells us, she died. And I can just see, and you can too, because you've been in these moments when somebody's passing away in their home, and you have family and friends gathered around, and there's... I've seen it. I've seen it numerous times. There's a kind of a hush that falls over the room as that last breath is drawn and let out. And for a moment, there might be a, a, a moment of silence and shock as the reality of death sets in on these people gathered around Tabitha. And then all of, the, all of a sudden, out of that silence and out of the shock comes great tears 
wailing, knowing that she's gone. And now in the first century world, they didn't have burial practices like we do. So it, because of the heat, because of the conditions, because of their lack of technology for embalming and things like this, they had certain practices, and one of them was that they would nearly always bury the body very quickly. They would get it prepared with spices, they would get it wrapped in whatever the necessary wrappings they needed, and they would find a tomb, and they would get that body buried away. That was the first century practice, but I want you to see something in this text. It doesn't say that they did that. It says in verse 37, look at the text. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now the question is, why would they lay her in an upper room instead of taking her to a tomb for burial? Well, I think that whenever that hutch fell over the room, and the shock set in, and the tears started to flow... Somebody came walking in from another room and said, listen, this may sound crazy, but I've just heard of the Apostle Peter. You know, the Apostle Peter, the one that walked with Jesus, the one that served with Jesus, the one who, uh, who, who preached the first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost. The, the, the Apostle Peter who watched uh, Jesus go to the cross and then saw him upon his resurrection, who was sent out personally. The Peter who was, who was restored, had the threefold restoration from Christ post-resurrection. That Apostle Peter is in a neighboring town about 12 miles down the road named Lida. And there in Lida, we know that Peter has been doing these amazing works Matter of fact, there was a man there in Lida who was, who was paralyzed. He was bedridden and paralyzed for eight years. And Peter healed him and had him to get up and walk by the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of him. Maybe, listen, and he's saying, he's saying to this crowd of people who are mourning, maybe, and maybe, it just sound, I know it sounds crazy, but maybe if we go and get Peter, then through the power of the Holy Spirit working through Peter... And through the, the qualifying work of the gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, maybe there's still hope for Tabitha. You see, and the question is, why, do they even, why would they even go there? Why would anybody have this idea? Well, the answer is because it's, it's this, and I really do believe this. Tabitha's ministry was so impactful on the community that it hurt them. It hurt their neighbors. It hurt their witness. It, it would have hurt their ministry in the community for Tabitha to be dead. And by the way, that's one of the marks of a healthy ministry. An effective ministry hurts the community when it leaves. Right? You ever hear of a church that, that closes its doors and no one in the community even knew or even cared? That's not an effective ministry. An effective ministry hurts the community when it disappears, when it goes away. And that was the case with Tabitha. And so they, they commissioned two people on this crazy journey to walk 12 miles. It's about a three-hour walk from Joppa to Lida, and they go to these, these two disciples, they go into Lida, they, they, they start asking around, they find the apostle Peter, and they say, listen, we know this is crazy, we have this Tabitha, she's a wonderful worker, of, of, and she's doing a wonderful ministry, she's got all this, but, it, but she died today, and, and we need help. And listen, Peter is on his way back from dropping the Apostle Paul off. Okay? He's just dropped uh, Paul off, and, and, and he's just on his journey back home, make, stopping and making some visits. He's got a wife at the house. He's got family obligations. He's got things going on. But I want you to notice, it doesn't say anything about that. Peter's not worried about everything else going on around him. He, he's not uh, holding himself rigidly to his own calendar or to his own schedule. But we see here in the text that Peter is firmly standing upon the scheduling that God has in mind for him. Because it says in, in, in verse 38, they say, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. Peter rose and went with them. And so they walked this three-hour journey back to Joppa from Lida. And so they come back into town. They find the house. They walk into the house. And you can imagine people are showing up. Hey, you know, Baptists are Baptists. Doesn't matter the culture. People are showing up with food, you know. And, and, and they're showing up with food. So they walk in and everybody's gathered in the lower rooms of the house. And, and, and there's a crowd at this point beginning to gather because this was a woman who had become very revered and very respected in their society because of her work for the Lord. 
So people were showing up in numbers. And they, they elbowed their way through the crowd, getting the Apostle Peter through the lower floor and up to probably the, the, the flat part of the roof, maybe a shed on top of the roof. They go up to this upper part of the, the, the house where this shed might be, and, and there are these widows who are gathered around. And the Bible says that these widows are showing uh, tunics and garments that she had made. Well, listen, I don't know that it was just because she was an amazing seamstress. I think that they're showing off the tunics and the garments that she made for them. This is the fruit of her ministry, the way that she was using the gospel. The gospel had impacted her in such a way that she loved the community around her and was ministering to those widows by providing them with clothing and serving them and ministering to them. And so they're showing off the work that Tabitha had done for them. But Peter walks into the room and he looks around and he sees what's going on and he can probably appreciate the scene. But then he does this very awkward thing. He walks in without knowing a soul, doesn't know anybody in the room. And he walks in and takes command and he says, I want everybody to leave. They're going, who are you? He's going, I want everybody to leave. And so they, they leave the room. They leave the room, and, and, and I love this. Look at the text with me. It says in verse 40, Peter put them all outside, and he knelt down and prayed. It's one motion there. He knelt down, and he prayed. He knelt down, and he prayed. You know what? Here's an interesting thing. When Peter comes in, this is the Apostle Peter. This is a man that literally has made lame people get up and walk. He's, he's healed people of their paralysis through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a man who walked with Jesus, who, who essentially made the first confession that Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah. This is a man, by every worldly uh, picture of what a man of God should be, this is a man of God with authority and with power. And he walks into the room, and you know what he does very first? He doesn't start doing anything. Peter walks in and he doesn't attempt anything. He asks God. He falls down on his knees and he begins to pray, the Bible says. He knelt and he prayed. And when you kneel, when they kneel, knelt in the first century, this was there was there was something extra reverent about it. Look right here. In, in the first century, their posture of prayer was not like ours. We have this understanding of posture of prayer. We come down and we kneel at the front, and, and that's, that's reverence for us. Um, and that's just kind of an average way to pray, right? In, in the first century, the average approach, the, the average posture of prayer was to stand like this, standing up with your hands open, looking to heaven as if to say, Lord, I have nothing to bring you. Would you fill me by your grace? Would you serve in ways and use me in ways that I can't even imagine? Lord, I have nothing, but you have, have qualified me and equipped me with everything that I need. So would you pour out your blessing? That's the first century posture of prayer. But in the New Testament, when somebody got on their knees before the Lord, this was extra reverence. This was as if somebody fell prostrate before God in our modern context, just getting down on their face because that's as low as they can possibly get. That's what Peter does here. He begins to seek after God. And you know what? I can't help but wonder. It doesn't say it in the text, but I can't help but wonder what he's, what he's praying. And I think it would have been something like this. Lord, first of all, is it even your will to bring this woman back from the dead? But secondly, if it is your will, God, I have no standing authority or ability to do that on my own, so would you empower me? Would you equip me? Would you minister through me to see this woman raised? And I think that he sat right there on his knees and he prayed to the Lord until he had a clear word from God. And then I love this. There's this fine detail in here. I want you to circle this word. If you mark in your Bible, it says in verse 40, about halfway through, it says, turning to the body. Circle the word turning. I love this. Peter didn't come in and get an evaluation of the situation. He didn't come over and check the woman's pulse. He didn't start deciding, well, what can I do? He walked in, he fell on his knees before the Lord, before he even looked at Tabitha's body. His primary focus was seeking and standing upon the will 
of God. And so he seeks God's will. He gets a word from him, and therefore he stands on God's will. He turns to Tabitha. He doesn't make a suggestion. He doesn't ask her, hey, Tabitha, would you get up? Rather, he issues a command. It's written in the imperative. He says, Tabitha, arise. He has sought the will of God. He is standing on the will of God. And God is therefore going to supply his will. That's how God works. There's no question in his mind. He's not tiptoeing around it. He looks at this dead and decaying corpse and he says, get up. And look at this. The first, uh, right, right there in, in verse 40. It says, And she opened her eyes. <laughs> Y'all ever been at a funeral when the body opened the eyes? No. I have. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine what happens in that moment. <laughs> She opened her eyes. Let's not discount what a big statement that is. This lady moments ago was dead. There was no air in her lungs. There was no blood coursing through her veins. There was no heartbeat. She was dead. But now, through the power of God working through the Apostle Peter, not through Peter's own ability, not through his own standing, not through his own power, but through the authority given to him by God, God working through him, Tabitha opened her eyes. And listen, hey, look, look right here at the text. Don't miss this. This has major implications for you has major implications. Because if the power of the gospel can raise Tabitha from the dead, then listen to this, listen right here. Then the power of the gospel can raise you. And not in a physical sense. Why would you, if you're dead, why would you want to come back to this earth? In an eternal sense. You can have eternal life. By the blood of Jesus Christ and through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. This miracle validates the gospel. He sought the Lord and God provided. And, and the very same God that brought Tabitha back from the dead will one day resurrect every one of us. The very same God that restored Tabitha, hey, he can restore you. The very same God that wiped the tears away from the widows standing around that day can wipe away your tears in the new heaven and the new earth. He is a powerful God and he is mighty to save. When it comes to our ministry, listen, there is nothing more vital than if a ministry is seeking the will of God and and standing in the power of God through the gospel. That is our hope and that is our strength. And that was what Peter was doing in this day. And so, so Peter ministers to this woman. She opens her eyes. And then I love this little, uh, these, these details here and the verbs of what Peter does. It says she opened her eyes and, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And in verse 41, it says he gave her his hand and he raised her up. And then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. I, I, I love it. So it's just like she's back to full strength. She went from not only dead, but right before that, she was deathly ill on her deathbed. And, and now she's at full strength because of the power of God working in her life. Peter helped her, and he presented her to these people. And, and then... Peter is a great apostle because he never let a good miracle go to waste, you know? He stood up, and when he presented her, I firmly believe that he presented Tabitha, and he said, now listen, Tabitha is not resurrected. Do you know that? Tabitha was resuscitated. You say, what does that mean? Well, if she was resurrected, she never would have died physically again. That's not what happened. She still had death on the line. She was still going to die. Physically, okay? Resurrection is eternal. That's why Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, right? It's eternal. He's, he, was the, he is resurrected Lord. And so he, he presented Tabitha and he said, 
Listen, this is amazing. She's back from the dead, and it's by the power of God, but make no mistake about it. This miracle is only a sign. And this miracle was done so that it would point to, and by the way, that's what signs do. Miracles are always in the Bible considered signs. That's what we're told over and over. Miracles are signs because signs are designed to point to things. Signs point us to things. The power of that miracle points us to the validity of the gospel message. And he looked at those people and he said, hey, you want to see, you think you've seen power now. Just wait till you stand before God. You're standing in front of Tabitha now, the resuscitated woman. Wait till you stand before Jesus, the resurrected Lord. Wait till you see that kind of power. This is, the, this is the kind of power that, that makes dead people live. This is the kind of power that makes us who are headed for eternal separation from God in a very real place called hell get eternal life in the new heaven and the new earth. This is the kind of power that we're talking about. And he, t- he that day preached the gospel to those people. And you say, Duncan, it doesn't say that in the narrative. How do you get that? Look down at the text. I'll show you. It says that He presented her alive, and in verse 42, it became known throughout all Joppa. So everybody found out that she came back from the dead, and, and that is a big conjoining word right there, and many believed in the Lord. Let me tell you something. Miracles on their own don't save anybody. We're always praying, Lord, send a miracle. Hey, if he does send a miracle, and it's in his prerogative, he doesn't have to. If he does send a miracle, you have to couple that with the gospel. And if you don't, you're in the wrong. Miracles point us toward the gospel. The only way that many people in that area believed in the Lord is if this miracle of Tabitha coming back from the dead was accompanied with the gospel message that saves people from their sin. He preached the gospel. And, and, and I love how you can begin, you're seeing here in this narrative and in the broader scope of Acts, how Peter and the apostles, their, their focus is shifting. They're morphing into um, the, the apostles that, that we, has set the example for us. They're, they're morphing into the image of a disciple that Jesus wants. See, at one time in Peter's life, he was such a, he, he, he was such a zealot for the faith. I mean, he, he just, he, he loved Judaism. He had a high Judaism. He was so focused focused and intent on the law, and I mean, that's just what, that, that's what they did. I mean, he was, he was this legalist, and, and all these questions about, well, how many times do I have to forgive somebody, and, and, and these kind of things, but now you're starting to see Peter's focus shift. He's, he's now no longer focused on the sign or, or rigidly following it. He's focused on salvations. He's no longer focused on on following uh, the letter of the law and trying to earn his own righteousness, but now he's trying to to lead other people to Christ so that they could receive and become the righteousness of God themselves. You're seeing Peter's focus shift to a ministry of people and a ministry to people. And he goes on in verse 43. He's so focused on people in this moment. He's so so intent to minister to these people and their needs that it says in verse 43, he stayed in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, I know that doesn't mean anything to you, right? You're not thinking, you're thinking, what does that, what does that have to do with anything? The tanner, probably the, the local tanner, he would tan hides for a living. Okay, well, there, there are a couple of problems with that in Peter's context. First of all, if you're a Jew and you handle death, you touch a corpse, you're considered unclean. Secondly, think socially for a minute. The tanner didn't live right down in the middle of town because he had a bunch of corpses laying around his house. The tanner lived outside the city because the stench was so raw and and, and so vile. And yet, Peter chooses to stay with Simon the tanner. Why? Because none of those other things matter to him anymore, but only people. People. It is a ministry of people. Let me tell you something. Peter's ministry was was focused on Christ, but it was aimed at people. And listen right here. This is what the text tells us. Look right here. 
your ministry as a disciple of Christ should be focused on people, or focused on Christ and aimed at people. Your ministry, every effective ministry of every disciple of Jesus Christ, every born again believer, is that he or she is focused on Christ and aimed at people, reaching people with the message of the gospel. Let me show you today quickly out of this text three requirements for an effective ministry. Three requirements. If you want an effective ministry in your life, say, Brother Duncan, I'm not called to ministry. Doesn't that mean I'm exempt from having to be a minister? No! If you're saved and born again, you have a ministry. You've got a ministry for the Lord, and you need to look at how to make that ministry the most effective ministry you can possibly muster. And the first thing that we're to do, according to this text, for an effective ministry, the first requirement is that we are to focus on people and not programs. Focus on people and not programs. You notice, when they came to Peter, they didn't have to convince Peter, hey, rearrange your schedule, let's let's redo a thing. You You know what Peter did? He just rose and went with them. He didn't, have some, he didn't have some quarterly curriculum he was trying to walk the people and lead it through where he's like, well, we can't, we can't possibly give up a day for that because we got this. He didn't, he didn't have some system where it was like, well, I mean, I can't go help her today because I lost my logbook and I can't record who I did. No, he's focused on people, not programming. And this is where in the church, hey, we have gotten this so backward. Programming is supposed to facilitate our ministry. But what's happened is we've allowed programming to hinder the ministry. And now it becomes about the program rather than the ministry. It becomes about the process rather than the people. We've gotten it backward. It's, <clears throat> it's out of whack. Hey, it's the person that... It's going to hurt. You ready? It's people when we walk into the sanctuary and there's a visitor sitting in your pew. I know, it hurts. And you go, hey, that's my chair. Listen, folks, that's not good. That's not healthy. That's not focused on people. It's focused on process. It's focused on tradition. It's not about that. It's about people. That's an effective ministry. Focused on people. And listen, I think in the church what what happens is, especially in the Bible Belt, we're right on the buckle of it, right? We have a tendency to become all about the administration of the church, all about the business of the church, all about the customs of the church, all about the denomination of the church, when in reality we're supposed to be about attending to the poor, building relationships, creating ministry moments, and discipling our brothers and sisters. It's about all these other things, but we've made it about the business. And that's, that is unbiblical, and it is wrong. If we want to have effective ministry at First Baptist Church, if you want to have an effective ministry in your life, you will make it about people, not programming. Does there have to be business? Yes. Does there have to be administration? Yes. Is that the primary focus? A resounding no. And if the process starts hindering the people and our reach of the people and our discipleship of the people, we need to rethink the process. And that is the reality of it. Focus on people, not programs. Second requirement for effective ministry is that we focus on going into the community rather than gathering from the community. We focus on going into the community rather than gathering from the community. What do I mean by that? That means that that if you want to be an effective disciple for the Lord, that means that the sole work of your ministry should not be within the confines of this building. That means we have to actually mobilize ourselves in such a way that we get outside of this building and we go into our community and we minister to people where they are. And I know that, that, you know, that just flies in the face of every, uh, every worldly philosophy for what's a successful ministry. If you're telling me, Brother Duncan, that... If we have 600 people at a service, 
That's not the definition of success. That is what I'm telling you. Success, listen, if we are basing our sole understanding of what is a successful ministry based on how many people are in the building, did you know that some of the most, the, 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 the most dangerous prosperity gospel preachers on planet earth would be considered successful by that standard? I think we ought to refuse to base our success or failure in ministry based on the number of people gathered in the building. That is a worldly gauge. I was doing some research this week on <clears throat> how, how, does, uh, how does a concert, like if you're putting on a concert, a music artist, how do they gauge success? And you know what one of the number one things? They have all these areas in there about how to get more people to your concert, how to advertise better, how to get more people in the building. And it's okay if you have a bad concert when, when not that many people are there, you see how the world gauges success. It's by the crowd size. You know, every time Jesus had a big crowd, he would start saying things like, Hey, guys, you need to eat me and drink me. And they're going, This guy's crazy. Like, he's total, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I don't want any part of that. Jesus was constantly trying to pare down the masses to get to the people who were disciples. Listen, our gauge of success cannot, and by the way, at First Baptist Church, it will not be the number of people in the building. Our gauge, our marker of success is going to be how many people were discipled this year? How many, how many church members are actively discipling someone else? How many, how many uh, people who we've baptized have we followed up with and are now plugged into a ministry where they're learning the Bible and they're serving the Lord and they're serving and, and, and seeking His will and serving alongside their brothers and sisters? How much follow-through have we given? It, it's going to have nothing to do with the amount of people in the pews and it's going to have everything to do with equipping people for the work of the ministry. We focus on people, not programs. We focus on going into the community not just trying to gather people out of the community. And then the third requirement for an effective ministry is that we are to focus on God's will and not our wants. When Peter walks in, the authority that he has, the title that he has, the status that he has, the position that he has, he walks in, he looks at Tabitha's dead and decaying body. He doesn't go straight up to it. He doesn't start trying to do anything. You know what he does? He gets down on his knees and he says, Lord, what is your will? He seeks the face of God. He doesn't, he doesn't buy into what everybody around him has told him needs to happen because they all have opinions. And by the way, we all have opinions. You get five Baptists together, you got 12 opinions. Right? I'm one of you. I know. We're, we're in this together. I've got, I can't agree with myself. Okay? But we're to focus on God's will and not our own wants. See what we do in the church sometimes? <clears throat> we listen to what everybody else is saying, and so we decide, well, that's just got to be what's, what's right. Because so-and-so said it, or my buddy said it over here, or this it turns into a beauty contest. I remember, and I, I was the president of my high school band, and, and I remember... Um, our band director, she was a Hall of Fame band director. She'd been in this thing forever. She knew what she was doing. And she always told us, listen, when we get out on that marching field and you get in your spot in the formation, if you're right, but everyone else around you is wrong, then you're the one that's out of formation and you need to file in with them, right? So that it makes the formation look right. Even if you're in the right spot, you can be wrong. That's what we want to do at the church, we want to say, well, I, don't, I, don't know. I know the Bible says this, but my buddies are saying this, and it really would rock the boat less if I did this. And listen, I, I do this too. We fall into this, this trap where it's like you want, to, you want to please people. You want to please standards. You want to please tradition. You want to, you know, all the customs, and we want to make sure that everybody's, you know, acting just like we should in traditional whatever church. And, and then at the end of the day, we're, we're all out of whack with God's will. In reality, if somebody would just stand on this book 
have the boldness to stand on this book, regardless what the world says, regardless what everybody else says, and focus on God's will, not what I want, not what you want, not what my buddies want, but on Him. It would radically transform Elk City. Focus on people, not programs. Focus on going into the community, not gathering people out of the community. Focus on God's will, not your wants. You say, well, how do I focus? Well, you know, Steve Jobs was asked that one time. How can you focus a whole group of people in the same direction? And he said this. And Steve Jobs said, you know, focus isn't willpower. And by the way, I'm not saying Steve Jobs was the paragon of Christian morality or anything like that. But he had a good word here. He said, focus is not willpower. It's not convincing people to just buckle down and get it done, right? He said, focus is having the courage to abandon a thousand great ideas to meet one big goal. The courage to abandon a thousand great ideas to meet one big goal. You know what our big goal here at First Baptist Church of Elk City is? Our big goal is to make disciples of everyone within our reach. Everyone within our reach. To make disciples. There are lots of good ideas. But are they advancing us toward making disciples? Here's an opportunity to make disciples right now. Hey, if you're in the room, I want you to look here at me. Everybody. If you don't know Jesus today as your Lord, can I tell you something? You come in here and you got baggage and you got hurt. And you've got, uh, you've got all these things going on in your life. You've got hurt, you've got hang-ups, you've got, you've got addictions, you've got problems, you've got family struggles. You've got all these things that you're bringing in here today. And you're really thinking, Brother Duncan, if you'd just be quiet, I could go eat some roast or I could go down to rib crib. The Methodists are going to beat us if you don't stop. I get it. I, I get what you're thinking. But listen, I got a word for you today, and it's straight from, the, from God. In his book, right? In the Bible, he says that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, boss, master, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will. That's a promise. So today, I want to invite you. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to, I want to invite you to come down here. We're going to stand here in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to have you stand after I pray. And when you stand up, if you don't know Jesus and you've got questions and you, you don't know, you know, you just, maybe you're just not sure about this whole thing, but you want to talk to somebody, I want to invite you to come down here. You can give me your hand. I'll lead you to Jesus and you can put your heart in his hands and he'll save you. He'll forgive you. He'll redeem you. And you can have eternal life today because he died for you on a cross. He rose from the dead. And now if you put your faith and trust, and trust in him and identify with him in faith, you be saved today. So I want to invite you to do that. Believer, maybe you got sin in your life. Maybe you're struggling. Would you come down here and repent? Come down here and refocus your heart on the ministry that God has for you. Make this a place of prayer today. Let me pray for you. Father, it is in the name of Jesus we come before you. With grateful hearts, Lord, knowing that you've given us everything we need for effective ministry. God, I pray that you would refocus our hearts here at First Baptist Church, that we would fix our eyes on you, that we would gauge success properly, that we would, that we would be intentional in our focus and in our ministries, in our care for the poor and ministry to the widows and and Lord, that we, would, that we would effectively steward the gift of your Holy Spirit in this place and in this people. And for the one or the many in the room today that don't know Christ, Lord, I pray that by your Spirit you would grip them now, that you would draw them by your power. Lord, that they would come and they'd put their faith in Jesus. That you would draw them now. And don't let them leave this place. Spirit, you've been called the hound dog of heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd chase after them. You'd grab hold of them and, and never let go until they repent of their sin and come to you. 
We thank you for it in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.